Hello, Houston. We hung you up with a question last time that I know in the intervening days has kept you racked with indecision. And the question was specifically, what do you get credit for on an exam? If I give you an exam here, a third of the way through the course after physiological, what do you actually get credit for on any, well, not even my exams, any exam that you take, what do you actually get credit for on an exam? That's student participation time if you hadn't anticipated it, and I'm paid so I can outweigh you. What do you get credit for an exam? What you've retained? No. It's a subset of that, but not exactly. It's another RE word. Anybody else? What you reviewed. Not what you reviewed. And you need to be on mic when you say that. Yeah. What you're able to recall? Bingo. In order to get credit for something, you have to be able to recall it. And I'll give you a specific example to prove the point that I'm making. And that is that if you've ever been talking with another person about a third person, and at one point one of you stupidly says, what's her name? And both of you agree, well, let's see, she's about that wide, she's about this high, she's blonde, and neither of you can remember her name. You know you know her, you know you know her name, you know that you have learned her name, but you can't recall it when you need it. Recall is the only process that will lead you to information from which you can gain credit. Now that's not true just in exams, it's true in life. If the manager comes in when you're working at age 41 and you've now risen to associate manager supreme, when the manager comes in and says, well, we've got a problem with and discusses something in the company and says to you, what do we do about that? You meaning you and the fellow associate managers. If you don't have an answer and somebody else does, you don't get the pay raise next time. So it's not true just here, it's true in life that if you don't have the answers when you need them, you don't advance. So in essence, in college, the thing you need to keep in mind in terms of exam prep is it's only what you can recall that you actually get credit for. But it's not just recall. What do you have to do with it once you've recalled it? I mean, it's not enough just read down through, okay, 24, and you say, yeah, that's recall the information. What do you have to do with that information once you recall it? You recite it? Recite it is part of it, but it's, it's a subset of that that I'm really, what are you going to do with it once you recall it and, and um, what next? It's more than just recitation. Um, use it and That's I enough. just forgot that. Stop right there. You have to use it. In other words, what you have to do, the word I use is apply it. Once you recall information that you need for an exam, you also have to apply it. Okay. If you can't recall and then have it bear properly on the, you know, being able to draw the information out that you need, the answer that you need, it's still useless. You still don't generate anything that gives you credit. So in order to get credit for an exam, you have to recall and apply the information. But that's not all. Let me describe for you the way I'll bet you take a test, <clears throat> ideally. When you take a test, you have a test coming up at 11 o'clock one morning, do you the night before study as you normally do, including a review of the course in which you have the information. Do you go back over the pertinent chapters and the relevant information, your notes, and then go to bed, stop working before perhaps even you normally do, relax, watch a movie, do something relaxing, go to bed and sleep a normal time, eight, six, five hours, whatever you normally do, get up at the normal time, go through the normal routine, arrive at school, spend an hour looking for parking places, of course, and then review the notes before class and then go in and in a leisurely manner lay out what you've mastered in the course? Does that describe your typical class day in class performance? <laughs> no, I, I can see a chorus of no. In my dreams it would be that way. In your dreams it would be that way. No, you stay up the night before because you have one more chapter that you've always meant to read and never gotten to. So you force yourself to read that last chapter, jam in all that last set of facts that were assigned several weeks ago. And what you do thereby is to lay a patina of confusion upon a base of total lack of understanding. And then go into the exam. And not only that, you then crank up your pressure on yourself. Oh, I've got to do this. This is the one thing that stands between me and graduating. If it does, you haven't been studying hard enough for a long time. But the point is, that you and I put a lot of pressure on ourselves. 
And I will show you literature when we get down into the learning and memory section of the class where I can demonstrate to you that the higher the drive, the higher the pressure on you, the worse your performance. Okay? Well, I'll even do it from your side. The higher the pressure on you, the, wor the worse your performance is. Okay? So what that says is when basketball teams are playing, that is a very sophisticated, very complex sport. And the reason they're good is because they practice and practice and practice. And that's, in essence, what's meant by recitation in the formula that we're in the midst of. And I haven't forgotten where we are on that. When we talk about recitation, what we're really talking about is reciting the information. And what happens on game day, for any of you who are athletes or have participated in intercollegiate athletics, you know that the pressure goes way up when you get to the actual competition. And in order to make sure that athletes do the right thing, like Carl Lewis here used to do, they practice over and over and over whatever their skill happens to be. So that when on game day, if you know things, as pressure goes up, performance does too. Your way, as pressure goes up, performance does too. Okay? If you know it. So for the stuff you rehearse, you would be better off. I don't know the exact figure here, but I am sure you would be better off on any of your exams studying a little bit less, a whole lot more. In other words, concentrate on the essence of what you need to learn in a course and study that so you know it cold. And don't worry so much about what Anderson and Anderson did in 1999, August issue. Worry more about the principles that Anderson and Anderson were studying or whatever study you're, you're going after. Okay? So the point is that in essence, what you get credit for on an exam is what you can recall and apply under self-generated pressure. Are any of those three processes input processes? Are any of those three input processes? <laughs> the odds are 50-50 you'll get it right. That's a yes or no question. <laughs> are any of those three input, recall, application, and the conditions of recall? Oh, I'm sorry, the conditions of application. Are any of those input? No, what are they? Doesn't tell me, put it on the mic. Output. Output, thank you. Yes, they're output processes. Tell me why it is then that everybody spends time getting ready for an exam reading. Reading is an input process. What gets you credit is recall and application. Now I'm not saying don't read. In fact, among all the things you do in college, after time management, reading is the number one thing you need to master. What to read, how to read it, and what you're looking for. That's what a part of a, that's what a major part of an undergraduate education is all about. It's teaching you how to approach the literature and what questions to ask when you're in there. So reading is important. But when you're getting ready for an exam, you should not be reading, you should be reciting. So I come back to the ratio that we were talking about last time. And the ratio between reading and recitation you should have about a four to one ratio favoring, actually the way I was doing it, is this. For every 12 minutes you spend reading, you ought to spend 48 minutes reciting that information. Now that isn't just verbalizing it. That may be writing down vocabulary lists. It may be doing experiments to demonstrate what, we're what you're studying about. It can be a variety of different ways. But in essence, you need to recite. You need to spend a lot of time reciting the information so that when you're, um, when you're preparing for an exam, that's the reason the ratio of reading to recitation is as high as it is, so as to maximize the knowledge that you have mastered in that particular situation. So reading, reciting, the last R then, you didn't think I was ever going to get to this, did you, is review. But what review means is not the way you and I normally approach it, and that is get through those last two chapters that I always meant to read. It means instead that if, if you've done the reading and the recitation as you should, what you have developed is a set of notes. You remember the, the um, the lesson we were giving you the other day about the, I don't know where the page is that I had, but the, uh, here it is, lo and behold. Um, we had the, the page that you had developed this way. What review means is essentially doing things like going back over the recoding that you did of the information that you wrote when you took the notes originally. Doing the recoding to go back over. That's review. You're reviewing, you're working with the information at that point and re you're reciting it and then just go, the review is simply going back over that to make sure that you've mastered the information when you're reciting it. What that means is if you do it in that way, that if you review it, you, that's the time when you may find, oh gee, that relates to and you think of another link that you can go pursue because you're interested in it. You've got the time to do it. 
And you can track down any tables that you forgot to master or a term, the definition of which you meant to master and forgot to. That's what you do in review. It's a kind of a, a recovery operation for anything you didn't get done during recitation. But don't make it the major prep. What you're really doing there is just going back over to make sure that you understand the underlying information. So survey, question, read, recite, and review. SQ3R. Now. We're going to talk about your grades today and how they're going to be determined. But one of the one of the um, one of the pieces of information I wanted to give you first was a little bit of help on some places to go to look for psychological literature because we're going to ask you to do an independent study and talk a little bit about that an independent project. There are several different sources that I can cite for you that are valuable places that are modern and current that will give you information related to psychology. One of these is a journal called um, a magazine journal called Scientific American. We have pictures of those magnificent journals for you. Uh, one of them is Scientific American, which almost every month has an article related in one way or another to, um, to psychology. Okay? A second one that's also good is a magazine called Psychology Today. It's a little glitzier, not quite as scientific as, as Scientific American, but it has a very good, it's, it's a very contemporary source for issues that are hot in psychology right now and experts' views on why it's an issue and so forth. Um, the third one, unfortunately called human behavior, was alive in the 70s and it has died an unnatural death, unfortunately. But if you can still track down issues of that, some of the articles in, in a, a magazine called Human Behavior were essentially timeless in, in, their, um, in their value in terms of, of you know, summaries of, of issues that have been and in many instances remain hot. There are two others that I would cite for you uh, for which we don't have uh, a visual. And these are the science sections in two major national newspapers. One is the Washington Post and the other is the New York Times. Both of those newspapers in their Sunday version have an entire section devoted just to science. And not every week, but occasionally you will find articles that are really quite on topic uh, related to issues related to psychology. They tend to be very current, very cutting edge uh, kind of, of issues that are being summarized there. So in essence, um, there are a lot of different um, sources of information that you can potentially utilize to, to get a project started of any kind. Now let's just kick back here for a couple of minutes and, and look at how we're going to go about grading you. For those of you that have already gotten the, the simple psych book, which is the course outline that I was talking about being available in the bookstore, uh, this particular one is blue. Um, the cover will be the same. The color may be different any particular semester that you're doing it, but what I'm, that you're getting it. But what I'm going to be talking to is, first of all, the syllabus, which is on forward five, right near the, um, the front of the, um, of the book. And then I will also be talking to the, um, the grades, which are summarized. How the grading is done is summarized right at the back of the forward section on page um, forward 19 in this particular version of the book. But in essence, what you'll see here is the, um, the lecture date or tape date. Um, we don't need to necessarily focus on that specifically because it's this particular semester. But the topic that is covered, um, the particular assignments that are due and when they're due are in here. And most importantly, over on the right side is the textbook chapter to be completed by 11 p.m. on the associated date. We make one and two, chapters one and two in the textbook that we are going to talk about some more here today, um, are nominally due uh, today, actually. You should have that one done today if you were going to be entirely on schedule. The actual due date for it, you will see, is a couple of weeks out here. Um, but by the time these, these non-bracketed numbers start falling, from this date onward in whatever semester we're talking about, you can't do chapters one and two anymore after that point. Chapter three falls the next deadline date, and there'll be specific dates over here that you can worry about for your semester. Chapter four falls a couple of lectures later, and so forth, all the way down through the semester. So you need to make sure that you stay current. Those are the dates beyond which you cannot do the text. So right now, when we're up in this part of the schedule, you can do the lecture, you can do the test, the test, the text tests anytime you wish to do so. How are we going to put your grade together? Well, in essence, we're going to do it in, in two components. The first component is going to involve having you do in class tests. That is, tests that we will give you on campus here. And that's for everybody, even the, those out in, in the great television land. Duh. Um, chapter one, or, or test one, the first in class test will cover the first third of the course. It'll fall right after physiological, and I'll get to those in a couple of minutes. Secondly, 
The second test will come about two-thirds of the way through the class and will cover the middle third of the, of the course. The third exam will be given on the day of the final exam at the same time as the final. So what that means is actually all four tests that you take are going to be the same kind of 49, 50 item multiple choice tests. They'll all be essentially 50 minute quizzes. And what that means is you're going to get two of those, not quizzes, I mean they're full blown exams. Um, but on the day of the final, you will in fact get two, two tests that day. Both the, the third test covering the last third of the course among three, and then the final which covers essentially everything. Okay. I stress that because what that means is both the third and the final will be given on the day of the final. And that's something that, that will bear relevance here in just a minute. Let me just step ahead here a little bit and say the fifth of the five grades that we collect, that we collect from this half of the course is an independent project that we want to ask you to do. I'll come back and talk about that in just a minute, but let me just talk about how these grades will be handled. First, second, third exam, the final, and then the independent project you got to do this. The independent project has an exclamation point next to it because I think that's where you really teach yourself most of the psychology you're going to master in this course. If you give us all five, that is you do a legitimate effort on the independent project, you've done tests one through three and the final, we will take the five of those grades and drop the lowest one. Whatever it is, if it's the project, okay, as long as it was a legitimate effort, we'll drop that. So your grade for this half of the course will be based on the four best out of five tests and projects that you do for us, okay? Now, for the quick mind, what that immediately leads you to think is, well, I don't have to take the final. Truly you don't, but if you think about it a minute, it is set up so as to be a win-win situation for you regarding taking the final. And what I mean by that is that if you've got two B's and a C or three B's and a C or something like that, all you have to do on the final is better than the worst of the other four grades. That is, when you get around to final time, all you have to do with that final is better than the worst of the other four grades that you got. The final will be kept and that grade will be dropped. The lowest grade will be dropped. If, in fact, the final turns out to be the lowest grade, it's going to be dropped automatically anyway. Okay? So, in essence, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain from taking the final. So, don't even ask me. When it gets to the end of the semester, my answer will be yes, you should take the final. Because unless you, if you've got straight A's, great, go for it. But if you've got anything less than straight A's, it is worthwhile to go ahead and take the final. Um, what that means is that you'll get two one hour, roughly 50 item exams for, during the final period. But the finals periods here, as you know, are three hours long. Each of the exams only takes you about 45 minutes. So theoretically, you'll be done, and most of the students are walking out after about an hour and a half during the final period. So we won't, it, we won't be pressed for time in that period. So that's half the, half the uh, grade, is, the, is the, um, the four tests and the independent project. The other half of your grade is the certification quizzes on the textbook. And I will Friday, no, stop saying time, I will on the third tape, the next lecture, I will be demonstrating the textbook for you fully, not only how to register for it, how to get it, and so forth, uh, but also how they, they, some of the major operating features in terms of the text itself. We will show you all of that on screen here on, um, on Friday. That book, as I, I kind of hinted at the other day, previous lecture, um, includes certification quizzes for each chapter. And that's the, the part that's on the right side of the, of the syllabus, the deadlines that fall through the semester. You should read, you can take those tests as many times as you want. I'm not going to say any more about it now because we'll talk about it completely um, in the next lecture and demonstrate some of the major features of the text for you then. But that's the other half of your grade. So we're going to get four in-class in tests, the project, and the, the textbook. Let me talk now about the project. You've got six options for how you go about doing this project. And I just realized there was one other graphic. Let me back up out of those grades for, no, let me finish the, the grades and then we'll, uh, I'll come back. No, in fact, because of the slide order, we've got to do this first. Let me jump back for just a second to what we were talking about relative to the, um, the SQ3R technique. I wanted to share one piece of information with you. And that is, this is a survey that was done at a major Southwestern University. It wasn't us, but it was another major state university um, in the greater Southwest somewhere. What they did in this study was to ask undergraduates, freshman, sophomore, in a typical mid-fall day, you know, mid-October sometime, how many hours would you spend in a week studying your courses? So they surveyed only students that were carrying five courses, and they asked them, roughly, how many hours would you spend in a week studying? What do you think the average answer was? 
What would you think the average student would end up studying? General mumbling. Well, let me show you some data. It's fascinating. It's quite illuminating, as a matter of fact. <coughs> this is what was found. If you look at the data, what that says is that 68% of those students carrying 15 credit hours studied 20 hours or less in a typical week. So in terms of that schedule that you're working on now, remember we did that two days ago, last lecture? Do that for a week and then think in terms of, it's this data that is the reason I suggest that you think in terms of doing at least 20 hours of studying a week if you've got a normal five course load. Because what that means is, given this data, that you're studying more than two-thirds of the students against which you're competing or with whom you're learning. Okay? 20 hours a week in addition to class load is not all that much. I think you could probably handle it if you worked at it a little bit. Okay? So just kind of keep that graph in mind when you're kind of organizing your life through this particular semester. 20 hours a week uh, studying will put you ahead of the vast majority of students in, in the, the school that you're in right now. Now, um, I totally blew myself. Oh, I know what I was going to talk about next. I'm glad I pay attention here. <coughs> what I'd like to do now is the survey part of the course for you. What I want to do is kind of walk you through the sections of the course that we're going to be, um, that we're going to be talking about. We are now just within a gnat's eyebrow of having finished the introduction to the course. You know who I am. I am increasingly knowing who you are, so we're getting, we're getting closer and closer and more familiar with each other. Um, so we're done with the first section, which is called, this is tantalizing, the introduction. We've finished that. We're going to move on to the next slide. And we're going to show you the second thing which we will be hitting starting in the next lecture after we've talked about the textbook, and that is history and systems. Can we get some slides on the camera, please? I don't want to be subtle about this. Two, three, four. We're going to wait. Or we can retape. Can I get some slides on camera? They must have a broken bulb. There we go. History of psychology. I told you it would be there. One of the questions we're going to we're going to we're going to ask there is who was the original psychologist? And that question will be not answered by the word Freud. It will instead be somebody else. And the question is how far back that is. I'm going to argue that the original psychologist actually goes back before the birth of Christ. And I'll see if I can define that, defend that for you in an interesting way. The next section that we'll go to is methods and data. We're going to start out with the statistics that psychologists use and, and get you unscared of them. Okay? We're going to get you unscared of them. One of the things that I will show you, for instance, related to the, the kind of question that we're going to be uh, talking about here is illustrated right in the uh, simple psych book. If you want to jump ahead to page 112 and look at this particular graph, what this graph is really showing you, and we can tighten right down on, on that, just that graph, um, is the following. This is the report of a company that, that reports the following. This is the, the sales figures, and they're not arbitrarily linked, but it's the sales figures for the summer, fall, winter, and spring quarter of a company. That company has had about a 30% downturn in sales during the, the um, spring quarter. You notice how the curve drops there on the left? Are those two curves identical? Do they communicate the same information, the one on the left and the one on the right there in that pair? No, they don't, psychologically. But technically, they do. Because if you look, what's happened is they've taken the data on the left and they've put it on a radial axis. So the same data is actually presented on the right side there. But it leaves you psychologically with a very different impression. You'd have a lot more fun investing in a company like the one on the right, wouldn't you? Because, yeah, they've had a kind of minor flattening in sales, but clearly the, the thing is still on the growth, right? <laughs> no. That second graph depicts the same 30% downturn in sales if you look at the labels on the graphs. 
Okay? We're going to show you a number of examples of that uh, from a marvelous book by Howard Huff that's almost 75 years old now called How to Lie with Statistics. It's only about 75 pages long, but it is jammed with examples of how statistics can be misused or at least used to miseducate or misguide um, in any kind of a situation. So that's the kind of thing we're going to do in methods and data. Not so much make you an expert statistician as to show you where some of the problems are and, and how to eliminate them as, as far as that's concerned. The next section then is development. Once we've got you fully functioning as a psychologist, we'll get into looking at developmental psychology. The kind of issue that we'll look at there is what's called a lifespan approach to developmental psychology. So we're going to start with procreation and go all the way through to dying and death. We'll take a lifespan approach. One of the questions that I will leave you with here today is, other than birth, what do you think is the most abrupt change in living style that you will ever experience? Other than birth, what do you think is the most abrupt change in living style that you will ever experience? People immediately say, death. That's not a change in living style. That is a cessation of living style. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about during life events. Other than birth, what do you think is the most abrupt change? I think you'll be challenged by what I'm going to choose as the answer. It isn't adolescence. It isn't getting married. It isn't leaving home. It's another event. It's developmentally related, but it's not any of those. So we, when we get into development, we'll take a lifespan approach. We'll kind of proceed through from beginning to end, but I will at that point pick one to defend and, and we'll see what happens. The next section that we'll get into is physiological. Once we've got you fully developed, then we're going to start worrying about how the internal plumbing operates. So we'll study the, the nervous system, which is really what drives all of the behaviors that we're going to be talking about here. And during this section, we will cover what are called altered states of consciousness. And I will report to you there the results of, of the experiment that is diagrammed here. This is one of my all-time favorite experiments done by a friend of mine at the University of Florida many years ago. What he did, it was just a devilish experiment, what he did was to put cats on a track, on a belt that was moving constantly toward water, very slowly. So the cats only moved, um, you know, it took about 10 minutes. If they hunkered down by the wall, it took about 10 minutes for them to move all the way to the point where they were going to fall into the water. And so a few cats got wet, but most of them in that situation very quickly learned, you got to get up every 10 minutes and move back, and they did it. The effect of it was that it prohibited dreaming. Because dreaming, it as we'll see when we get into that section, it takes a while to be deeply enough asleep to be able to dream. Okay? And so in essence, what this apparatus did was very effectively prevent the cats from dreaming. The question is, did it show up in their behavior in any way? And essentially what it does is to provide an answer for the question, do we dream? Do cats dream? And more importantly, do we dream? Do we have to dream? And I, that study will provide an answer for that particular question. So one of the questions we'll look at is, is do cats, uh, do we dream? And do we have to dream? Then we get from, from physiology into the, the interactive system. Now we're starting to reach outside the organism. We'll look at sensation perception as our next major section. And there are a variety of different ways to illustrate this particular phenomenon. So let's just spin ahead in the slides and see what we've got, and I'll talk to those. Which of these two buildings, not these two, this one on the left, is this building on the left taller or is the next one taller? And if we can go to the next slide, or this one. If we can back up one, I don't know whether the equipment can do that. Yeah, there we go. That's the IDS Tower in Minneapolis. Compare that with the next one, which is the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco. Which of those two tall towers is taller? And I think you'll be surprised at the answer, because the answer is that one of them is almost twice as tall as the other one. But what's happened is that the architect on this building has done something unusual to throw off your normal depth perception. We'll cover that, among many other things, in looking at vision, hearing, and so forth, and so on. In, um, in sensation perception. Here's another cue. This is a bridge going across the uh, river into Ottawa, going across the St. Lawrence River from New York State into Ottawa. I can see at least a half a dozen cues that you and I use to depth and distance judgments that are represented in this picture. Can you identify all of them? I'm going to suggest that there are almost a dozen that we can use. Not all of them are there. But there are almost a dozen cues that you and I use when we are judging things like depth and distance. We'll get into that a little bit later in the sensation perception course. Are the two parallel lines, I should say, are the two lines that are parallel to the bottom of the screen parallel to each other or not? Or do they seem to bow inward? 
in essence there you're suffering, not suffering, you are experiencing an illusion. There are people in Africa who are raised on the plains who do not, are not subject to that illusion at all. The reason you and I as Westerners raised in the kind of society we have are subject to this is because of the environment in which we grow up, the square environment that we have. And I don't mean that as a put down, but as a description. We are in a very linear environment and the result is that we are very subject to illusions. And, we'll show, and that's a misfiring of the brain. It's a case where the experience you've had doesn't allow you to interpret incoming information. So we'll show you how illusions work in the section on, on sensation perception. The next section that we'll get into then is learning and memory. And we'll either have another, um, there we go, learning and memory. We're going to look at things like what is the nature of learning? How does learning differ from memory? Is it possible to study learning without studying memory? And it turns out the answer to that, surprisingly, is no. You have to assume the existence of one in order to study the occurrence of the other. We'll look at a, a demonstration in which I will show you as many as 12, somewhere between 9 and 12 different items and be able to demonstrate that your recall accuracy of those 9 to 12 items when you've seen them for 1 20th of a second, not even that, yes, 1 20th of a second, is about 75% accurate. Now you and I slave over verbal materials trying to learn it and then it turns out that we can actually look at an item and have it taken away. One twentieth of a second and it's gone and then our recall accuracy for a portion of that item is about 75 percent accurate. Which tells us something about memory that we'll, we'll demonstrate for you a little bit later there. I'm not sure whether we've got an illustrative slide for learning and memory or not but we'll see or we'll move on to the next section which is language and communication which will be the one that we follow immediately into after learning and memory. And in language communication, we will get into a variety of, um, of, of pieces of information, such as, and if you know the answer here, do not verbalize it, but in essence, the, the question that I would ask you is, do you know how to pronounce the word G-H-O-T-I? If you're with anybody else, do not verbalize it, but rather simply ponder that for yourself. Do you know how to pronounce the word G-H-O-T-I? Does anybody in the room here who's with us in the studio know the answer to that? Does anybody know how to pronounce the word G-H-O-T-I? Well, the answer turns out to be no. One person maybe, okay? What he and I share in common is the fact that we understand the symbol itself, we understand the pronunciation rules, and we understand the word class. And if we have those kinds of pieces of information and a grammar with which to express it, we can communicate with each other. So he and I could have a conversation using G-H-O-T-I as a word and be effective in communicating. But the rest of you, because you don't understand the pronunciation, the meaning, and the grammatical uh, use of the word, will literally be fishing through your entire vocabulary looking for the actual correct pronunciation of that word. And yet the person in the room who indicated that they knew, uh, thought they might know the word, I can tell from his smile that in fact he does, because he will now verify that within the last minute or two I have actually used the word G-H-O-T-I correctly in a sentence, right? Okay, and the nod from him was yes. So that's one of the things we'll teach you in language and communication, how we interact with each other. There's one other major internal variable that we also need to, to cover, and that is motivation, our drive state at any particular time. Motivation and motion takes a number of different um, sequential um, arenas or, or stages, I should say. It goes through a number of them. Have you ever gone over to Astro World and stood next to the Texas Cyclone pictured here and listened? What do you hear? What do you hear when you stand next to the Texas Cyclone? Any of you who've been there? Get on the mic. I'm going to wait. I can Screaming? outwait you. Screams, right? Yeah, a lot of them. A little bit of machinery sound, but mainly screams. Now that's kind of interesting if you think about it a minute. People, what's it cost to get into to Astroworld now? 30, 35, 40 bucks? I mean, it's a bunch of money. A lot of fancy rides and everything, but it's a bunch of money. So people get in there, particularly young adolescents, junior high, early senior high school, get in there, get on that ride, and ride around screaming bloody murder. So you're paying 30 bucks to terrorize yourself. And that's what they do. I'll work out a deal with you. You bring your younger brother or sister to me, pay me 20 bucks, we'll split it, and I'll scare the hell out of them. So why do we do that to ourselves? I mean, uh, uh, 
a roller coaster is essentially an overstimulation device. You and I, in modern times, go into entertainment parks to be overstimulated. And the, what the rides are doing, if you look at what's going on nationally over the last 10 years, as we get into the 21st century, the, the record with, with uh, roller coasters now is how fast, how fast can they make it go and how far can they make it drop and how steep can they make it turn, all of which is intended to increase the terror that you and I experience. And yet we stand in line and pay money to do that. There's a very basic psychological reason why we do that, and we're going to cover it in the section on motivation emotion. Okay? That's the last major internal factor that we'll look at. We've kind of covered heredity in the development and physiological section. In sensation perception, we begin to blend over into the environmental factors, the learning, the extent to which learning impacts us. That we cover in learning um, language. And then we have the last major section, which deals with an internal factor, and that is motivation and motion. From this point onward, we're now going to be looking at comparing one another uh, with one another, comparing ourselves with one another. And that puts us into things like individual differences and testing, okay? Where we take, um, whether it's intelligence tests, personality tests, any of a variety of different types of tests. The key thing that's going on there is to essentially um, begin to, to uh, compare ourselves with other individuals in that particular um, situation. Um, with that, we can, we can look at things like the Rorschach test, for instance, um, the, the kind of ambiguous uh, pictures um, that depict a given situation and are abstract enough that it's not immediately clear what is actually being depicted in a given situation. That's an example of what's called a projective test. Another way to label that would be a subjective test. But the idea is that when you look at that, you may see a kind of an abstract of two females facing each other, maybe two dancers or something like that. Um, there are a variety of different interpretations that can come out of that. Um, the interesting thing is that the reliability of the Rorschach test is atrocious, very poor, relative to most of the other major tests that are used like the Stanford Binet or, or even better, the, the uh, Wexler and so forth, the reliability for that kind of a test, which is objective, much higher than for something like the Rorschach, which, which is a projective test. And the net result then is that, that um, the, the question is, because up until recent years, the Rorschach was always among the top five most frequently utilized tests nationally each year in terms of sales and yet it has atrocious reliability. So the question is, why on earth would we be using a test where we know the reliability, that is the ability to reproduce findings in repeated testings, is very low? Well, there turns out to be a very good defense for that, which we'll cover in the section on individual differences and testing. It's used for a purpose other than testing. It tends to be used in a therapeutic situation, but it has a therapeutic goal rather than a testing goal. So we still continue to use it, actually, much of the time. Then we get into the, the last two major sections of the course that we'll, um, that we'll talk about are, first of all, the study of personality. This is actually among the largest sections of the course in terms of the amount of time that we devote to it because we're, personality, which is the primary reason most people go into psychology, um, covers a wide variety of different topics. We're going to actually divide it into three kind of major areas. The first thing we'll do is look at theories of personality. That will be our very first um, component. Uh, and in there, the illustrative slide, I believe, will illustrate some element of, of what we're going to deal with in, in personality. Uh, and that is, uh, first of all, theories of personality uh, and how they differ or, or are similar to one another. Secondly, we'll look at psychopathology, uh, the various kinds of problem, uh, problems that may crop up. And then lastly, as illustrated here, we will look at the, the various ways, the various forms of therapy that are available to us. Um, do you go in for uh, group-based psychotherapy? Because if you hire a psychoanalyst to sit with you and listen to your problems during the course of the years, you're going to spend a bunch of money. And many of us are not rich enough to be able to afford to put a psychologist on staff to get ourselves straightened out. So the option then is you go into some kind of a community treatment resource. And the, the nature of the way in which therapy is offered nowadays has changed markedly in the last quarter century. And we'll show you some data so that you can see exactly what's going on when we look at um, uh, things like community mental health and, and community service. In essence, that is the, the primary goal that we will, um, that we will talk about. Um, finally then, um, the last major section that we will get into, actually there are two more I'm going to talk about here briefly. One is social psychology. This is us at our very most complex where we are dealing with, with uh, you and I interacting with one another. 
One of the things we'll answer there for you is a question related to the following, and that is, what two things do you always do when you get on an elevator? What two things do you always do when you get on an elevator? In the studio, answers. What two things do you always do? Yes? Push a button. Okay, but there's something you do before that. You turn there's around one thing and you have face to, the front. I heard it. On mic. You turn around and yes, face the door. Exactly. When you get on an elevator, the first thing you do is turn around, and the second thing you do is press a button. Now, the interesting thing is, if you watch people, the other thing that they often do is to look up, check, see which floor the elevator is on, which has always struck me as an especially dumb thing to do, okay? Because if the elevator isn't on the floor that you're on, you just killed yourself anyway, and it doesn't matter. But we tend to do that anyway. So arguably, we turn around, we see what floor we're on, and we press the button to tell it where to take us. What would you do in a situation where, when you got on the elevator, everybody was facing the back? It was kind of like we forgot to turn around, okay? So this is what you face when you get on the elevator. Oh, I'd always wanted to read that book. Son of a gun. Well, we'll do that later. Um, so what do you do in that situation? If everybody else is facing the back and you get on the elevator, which way do you turn? You've got four choices, as it turns out. We actually studied this here, mimicking something done on, on Candid Camera many years ago. You've got four choices. I'll give you the four and you can vote which of these you would do. How many of you would be likely to get on and face the front? Okay. How many of you would be likely to get on and face the side? That's a cop-out option, but at least you can keep your eye on the crazy people while you're also watching which floor you're going to. How many of you would do that, get on and face the side? On mic. Get on mic. Press the mic button. I'd like lean up against the wall and be sideways against the wall. Okay. Like okay. Interesting strategy. How many of you would get on and face backwards? Conform, but at least you get there. Okay. How many of you would take the fourth option, which is, no thanks, I'll wait for the next car? Okay. I am telling you, you're wrong. Okay. You are widely wrong. All right. We did this with 200 people. Five undergraduates rode up and down in, in the eighth floor elevator in the main library here on, the, on this campus. And in fact, they tested 200 people. In each case, to qualify, the person getting on could know none of the five and had to be alone. So it was one person getting on with five he did not know, he or she did not know. And you're way wrong. Okay, you will be amazed when I show you that data in the section on social psychology. But there what we're looking at is the impact of various people on each of us on everybody else. Okay, we'll talk about that in social psychology. The final section we're going to have is a surprising one in most books, in fact in almost all books of psychology, and that is a conclusion. It seems to me kind of dumb to talk to you for all this length of time and then not give you a hint as to where we are ultimately headed with psychology. So in the last lecture or two, what I'm going to do is kind of review what I think psychology has contributed and make some guesses about where I think the jobs are in the future and so forth. So those will be the kind of things that we, um, that we talk about. Now, the reason I've got so much time is that I finally realized that I, I, um, um, I did talk about the independent projects, didn't I? I did not. Okay. That's why we have so much time left. I got panicky there for a minute. Question. Are you always going to run the mic. class right up until 1 o'clock? Or, yeah, 1 o'clock? Let us uh, handle that off camera later. Um, the five, six types of projects that you have or can do involve the following. One is to do a term paper. Pick any topic related to what we're talking about in psychology and write a paper on it. The limit will be five pages on all of these papers. That doesn't include the title page, it doesn't include references or anything else you may submit with it. But the guts of the paper is limited to five pages, okay? The deadline will be in the syllabus in each case uh, in terms of, of uh, when it's due. Um, you can write a paper. Any topic, as long as it relates to psychology, if you can find a paper that you write in English that will also work here, great. I have no problem with that. The one thing you have to be aware of is that we will require that it be in APA style. APA style, not MLA style. MLA style is fine and it's used in, in the fine arts a great deal. It is not used in the scientific disciplines. Most scientific disciplines tend to write with something like the, the, the style manual of the American Psychological Association called APA style. That's the style we'll want. Term paper is one possibility. Second possibility, a book critique. 
Okay? If you want to take a book and critique it, this is not a summary. Okay? The key word there is critique. On a five-page paper, that would mean you might spend a page and a half telling us what you've actually done. Okay, what, I'm sorry, what the book has actually uh, done in that situation. We're going to wake him up in the engineering booth, walk around here a little bit. Um, we want you to critique it. Spend half of the, um, the paper, a third of the paper, telling us what you've actually written, about, uh, what you've actually read, okay? Two-thirds of it, we want you to engage yourself with the author and criticize what he or she has done constructively. That is, you may agree with them, in which case we want reasons why. You may disagree with them in which case we want reasons why. You may be completely neutral, in which case we want reasons why. Okay? So the most important question you're answering with a book critique is the question, why? Okay? Why are you taking the position that you are taking? Book critique. Third possibility is to do a piece of research of your own. Okay? What I'd like to have you do, and we don't want a master's thesis out of this, we'd just like a very simple, straightforward, uh, one variable thing, one thing that you manipulate uh, to three or four levels and see what happens. Did I describe the grocery store example for you? Okay. A student in business administration several years ago had a classic example of a great study of the kind we have in mind. What he did, he worked at a, at a local grocery store, and he convinced his manager to give him control of the end, I don't forget the, what they call them, but the bins at the end of the, of the aisles. Those are high sales areas in a grocery store. He convinced his manager to give him control of that. <coughs> what he did was to put up a sign the first week that said simply, sale, one bag, 99 cents, and he had the bin just filled with potato chips bags. His dependent variable, what he measured, was the number of bags that he sold. Okay, so he just had the sign up, the bin was there, he kept it full, and he just counted the number of bags he sold. Second week, same, arena, same design, same arena, same everything, but now what it says is sale, two bags, $1.98. And what he'd done was to staple two paper chip bags together and fill the bin with, with double stapled bags. Third week, you can predict it, three bags, two ninety seven, dollars And the fourth week, same sign, everything, big sale, Four bags, three ninety-six. So the per bag chip cost <coughs> was identical all four weeks, and all he had to do was count potato chips. And you know what? He sold more than four times as many potato chips the fourth week as he had the first week. More than four times as many potato chips. Thereby very convincingly demonstrating that you and I are suckers for multiple pricing. And we are. But that's what I have in mind by way of a very simple, straightforward study. Any variable with two or three values to it so you get some idea of what's happening. That's all. The other possibility is to, to the fifth possibility, I should say, is to serve as an undergraduate research assistant. I guess that's the fourth possibility I've discussed. Graduate students in psychology are often doing experiments, and you may want to, to jump in and help somebody with a master's degree or a dissertation or who's striving for the master's degree or dissertation. They can often use help will probably require coming to, to the U of H to do, and it may not be an option that's available for everybody. But we will post notices near the beginning of each semester when those kind of options are available uh, on the bulletin board across from room 103 in Heine. The fifth possibility is volunteer services. If you want to do a volunteer service project of some sort, we will have uh, posted on the arena, on, on the uh, bulletin board, I should say, in, um, in Heine. Uh, again, that same bulletin board across from 103, working relations with about two or two and a half dozen agencies all around the city. We've got working relations with St. Luke's and their volunteer program, with St. Joseph's and its volunteer program. Uh, we've worked with the Respite House at, at Herman Hospital, um, the Ronald McDonald House, tutorial programs in elementary, junior high schools, and so forth. Um, <coughs> excuse me, old age homes. Um, Casa de Esperanza, which is a, a um, home targeted primarily at, at Hispanic uh, victims, uh, children and mothers in abusive situations. Um, the Rape Crisis Hotline, or, or more generally the, the Houston Area Women's Center. Um, several of these programs have very extensive training programs, and in a number of those, we will give you credit for just going through the training program itself. Some of the agencies <coughs> actually require a, um, <coughs> I hope my throat doesn't give out in the last minute and a half, um, 
we will give you credit for just going through the training agencies, uh, the training experience. Some of the programs actually require 100-hour contributions because they have a lot of front-end expense in training you. The one thing that I would request of you is that if you do the volunteer services thing, <clears throat> make sure that you follow through on your commitment because you've got youngsters in some cases tutorial <coughs> who are hanging on your advice and you need to be sure that you're there delivering the services that you promised to. <coughs> gag, gag. The final one is a media project. If you're good with a camera, if you're good with lettering, if you're good with painting or um, <coughs> pencil drawings or anything like that, we'd love to have you update the materials in the course because we're always looking for new stuff. About a third to forty percent, maybe almost half of the material you will see this semester has been student produced at one time or another. So in essence, we're always looking for materials that have been student produced. We've had people do uh, uh, poetry, <coughs> write plays, uh, develop songs. We can take anything. Sculpture, I will show you one in fact in the next program that was a student produced um, work of art. So the media project is the sixth option. Any of the six We'll give you about three weeks, and then you need to submit an approval sheet to us to tell us what you're going to do. I shouldn't say three weeks. What I should say is we'll give you about three to five, six programs in order to make up your mind and then communicate to us what you want to do. If I'm not dead, I will be here next time to show you how to operate the book. Thank you much. <laughs>